today about being stressed out. And, uh, you know, a lot of us are stressed out. And uh, today, oftentimes, if there's any small kids, we'll let them go. No small kids. Okay. Um, and talking with some of our university students, they only have three weeks left. So uh, I want to talk to you about being stressed out. Now, I'm not going to teach you how to be stressed out, okay? I was talking with Nikki Lucchese beforehand, and she said, oh, good, I can hardly wait to hear this. I said, I'm going to teach you how to be stressed out. She says, I'm already there, so I'm not going to teach you how to do that. We have enough stress in our life, but let me preview this coming series for us. We've got a series of messages coming up, and uh, I want to talk to you about things that are real in life, things that we all struggle with and give you a biblical basis to be able to get through it because God's Word is not just theory or philosophy. God's Word is extremely practical and He covers everything that we need to know about life and everything that we need to know about Him and everything we can know about Him. So therefore, we're going to find out how to apply these truths and we're going to do it by looking at basic topics. So this real life series will have myself, it will have Pastor Allen's going to be teaching, and Pastor Debbie's going to be teaching as well. So if you'd like, you can stay tuned for these, and we'll give you a list of them. I think one of the ones that's coming up, I think, next week is comparing ourselves. Because we always look around and compare ourselves. Yesterday after... <clears throat> After the breakfast, uh, we went out to the shooting range, and it was a spur-of-the-moment thing. And, of course, all the guys are going, whose gun is the biggest? You know? And so we compare ourselves. <clears throat> and so we compare ourselves, and, of course, I humbly brought the smallest. And, and uh, so we want to look at these real issues that we have in life. And... Um, so it's just a great thing. Now, some of the stresses that we face are because of family matters and things that happen to us. And so I'm going to ask Lisa to come up, and she's going to share with us a recent thing that could stress her out. So, Lisa, would you come? Sure. Good morning. Hi, Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I bring a word of hope, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Um, so about it's seven years ago, just... March 30th, um, but it's been heavy on my mind, and so uh, seven years ago we got a phone call at 11 o'clock at night. We were asleep at home in Needles in the desert, and we got the call that nobody wants to get. Um, so three of our family members were killed in a car accident in Needles on our golf course road. So it was three generations. They were all named Pete, so it was our Uncle Pete, he was 50, his son was 30, and his son was 10. So three generations gone in a car accident. So, you know, you that night was awful, of course, you know, and at that time, I was going to a little Christian church in Needles, we grew up there, but I never really, like, I don't want to say I didn't believe, but I didn't have the comfort that I needed to have at that time. And I know a lot of my family members didn't because a lot of them weren't saved, you know. So it was a hard time because I felt like I needed to be who I am and strong for them. But yet in my heart, I didn't feel the strength that I really needed. It was kind of just putting it out there because it had to be at that time. So to make a long story short, um, I really feel like things like that happened, it was bad. But at the same time, I feel like a lot of good came out of that because, um, and of course, I don't mean their passing, of course, but just starting my job at the Infusion Center, um, it's my second week now, and I'm seeing people that come in and they know they're going to die, a lot of them, or they have got, I shouldn't say no, but they have gotten the, you know, terminal illness, you're going to die. You know, and they come in, and I look at them, and I think they smile when they come in, you know. And so it's teaching me, just being here in Cedar City and being a part of Westview has taught me um, that 
you know, um, death isn't the final answer. It's not. It's just right. their 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 shell is you know was here. And so now I'm starting to realize and I'm starting to feel fulfilled and have um, the faith in my heart that I really know. It's not something that I can just say, oh, well, we're going to see him again. I really know we are now. And so thank you. I wanted to share that. I think remembering is a key part of what we do, and uh, one of the stress things that we can do is we can remember the time of God's goodness. Yes. And like last Sunday, which was the first Sunday of the month, and we celebrated the Lord's Supper, because he says, this do in remembrance of me. So whenever we think about the stress that Jesus was going to face, and the stresses that we face in this life, we can always remember what he has done for us, what he's going to do to us, what he's going to do with us, and what he's going to do uh, on our behalf. And so it's a very important thing for us as we think about stress that always needs to be in the back of our mind that our God is in charge, our God knows, our God cares. Right. He has done so much of that that he has even put our past in the past. Your past is past. Whatever the enemy is telling you about your present doesn't really apply, and he can't condemn you either because if you trust in Jesus Christ, your past is past. Amen. So that removes, for me, it removes a lot of stress. So let's take a look here at being stressed out. I picked the title because it seems like whenever we look around in modern culture, we find these areas of stress for people. These are, these are areas, if you ask people in the population, 64% are stressed out over finances. I don't worry about it, I just spend. You know? <laughs> so that's not a good answer, however. 60% uh, are stressed out about work. Do I love my job? Do I want to do this? Do I want to work? Do I want to have to get up? You know, all of those kind of things. Am I secure in my workplace? What is it? Family responsibilities. Another high percentage, 47% of people are stressed out. Now these things have some real mental aspects to them. So if we look at mental sy symptoms, then we'll see that there are some real mental symptoms that uh, come up. Anger or irritable. Anybody here ever fall into that trap? No? Okay, good. All right. Uh, how about anxiety? Oh, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going on. How about uh, depression? Oh, man, do I have to get up this morning? I don't want to get up. I stayed all up all last night worrying about this morning, so I don't want to get up. So these are some of the mental things that we see. Sometimes these things are not just due to stress. If you are suffering from these things, please see a physician after you come up to get prayed for. And we'll watch as God does great things, either through the Holy Spirit immediately or whatever. There's also physical symptoms that go along with stress. And so here's some of the physical symptoms. Don't raise your hands. Uh, headache, back pain, heartburn, acid stomach, elevated blood pressure, rapid heartbeat, migraines. Uh, do you ever sit and take your resting heartbeat? It's easy to do. You can either just do it right here on your carotids or you can do it right here. Uh, one of the things that is good to do is see if you're running right in the 50s and 60s, you're in good shape. And so we need to understand that these are all of the stresses and we don't want any of them. There's two types of stress, i got to tell you. There's uh, first one is called distress. And we're all familiar with that one. Hey, I'm in distress. How do I get out of this mess? How did I get into this mess? What am I doing in this mess? That's distress. There's another type of stress, and it's called eustress, E-U stress. And it was found by a Swiss physician, uh, uh, an endocrinologist. And what it is, it's the, res it's, it's the life energizing that is given by positive circumstances. So you can actually, your body can actually uh, receive positive stress. And it has to do with a hormone called cortisol. And cortisol is secreted by your adrenal glands whenever there is a stimulus. 
And so the stimulus may be something that moves you to flight, or it moves you to fear, or it moves you to something else. It can also be like whenever, whenever I drive my, <clears throat> whenever I drive my favorite vehicle, then I experience youth stress because it feels good. It's fun. I love it. Riding a motorcycle, youth stress, not distress. And so there are all these positive things that we feel that actually contribute to our positive well-being and do that. So that's your clinical notes for today. Okay, where did stress come from? And I'm talking about the negative type of stress. It came whenever Adam and Eve violated God's rules. We always need to understand the source so that we can deal with it and understand what hope God has for us. Death entered in the form of worry about life because you see whenever they were in the garden before they choose to believe the snake then what they were doing was they were living fully and completely in the presence of God and experiencing life and life to the fullest. It's interesting to me that the first irrigation system was designed by God because it said that the moisture would come up from the earth and would water the plants. You didn't need to go to Rainbird to get it done. And so God had everything ordered and there was no chaos whatsoever. Whenever God created everything, he didn't just take stuff from chaos and reorganized it. What he did was he created everything. And God always says, and on the first day, I did this and it was good. And so if God says that it's good, it is definitely good. And so whenever we see these accounts of creation in Genesis 1 and even in Genesis 2, we find that God created things good and he created them in order. You know, a lot of times we come to the New Testament stories about where Jesus tells the disciples, uh, let's go across the lake. And the disciples really don't want to go across the lake because the lake to them represented chaos and evil and destruction. So they really didn't want to go across the lake. And so not only that, they went out there, Jesus wasn't with them, and they're in the middle of a storm, and Jesus is acting like he's going to walk right by them. I mean, talk about panic. These guys were not recreational swimmers. They did not enjoy being out on the water just for fun. And uh, so chaos entered with Adam and Eve. It was a form of death. It represented the death of peace. And so <clears throat> whenever we look at that, we see that suffering and failure... Has anybody in here ever failed? Yeah, a few of you. Uh, okay, you're on my side. Suffering and failure became part of human existence. And so we see it right away whenever they're kicked out of the garden. I mean, talk about sibling rivalry. Cain kills Abel. How big does it get? And so we know, too, that only God can provide true peace. We need to understand that Jesus <coughs> conquered Satan in the wilderness during the temptation, and he conquered Jesus fully, in, I mean, Jesus conquered him fully and completely with the resurrection. Amen. So Jesus modeled for us the behavior that we can rely upon God's word to be able to conquer these feelings of inadequacy, anxiety, and everything else. There's really three things that... Uh, Satan went after Jesus with, and the first one is provisions. Turn these stones into bread. And Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word <clears throat> that comes out of the mouth of God. So we find Jesus is using God's word to refute what Satan is coming at him with. And so it's the same thing with the other ones, protection and position. And so we know that as Jesus comes, he sets us free. So let's look at some of the Bible stories here, and let's see now that we know where stress comes from. <clears throat> I've heard these Bible stories pretty much all of my life. I love these Bible stories. I can see myself in a lot of them. But have you ever thought about Abraham and the stress that he endured being called to go to a new land that he didn't know where it was or what it looked like, but he just had to trust God. 
Okay, think of that. <laughs> think about that. Sure. Stress? Sarah is saying, I don't know why we have to go there, honey. <laughs> I like it here. There's no ball in the promised land. Can you imagine the stress? At one point it says to rescue Lot that he took his 300 armed men. So how many people are going with Abraham? How many people is Abraham responsible for? No stress? Oh yeah, I'm trusting God. I'm, I'm doing fine. Part of the white knuckle club. You know, I'm just right. hanging on. My knuckles are white from fear. How about some of these others? How about Moses? He was raised in Pharaoh's household. Now he's going to go back and tell Pharaoh, hey, let my people go. What do you mean your people? They're my people. I own these people. How about the stress there? We can only see a little glimpse of it in Scripture because there's a lot of other things going on. The most important of which is that God is supreme and sovereign and He conquers everything. How about uh, Joshua? All of a sudden you've been in the wilderness for 40 years with these people and now you're going to take them into the new land? Any stress? Where's our bread? We don't have any water. What do we do now? I don't know. You know, it's just like sometimes we need to ask ourselves a question. Could we follow God the same way these guys did? What if we were like Joshua, and if Joshua would say, I don't do Jordan River crossings. <laughs> or how about if Virgin Mary said, I don't do virgin, virgin births. Or how about even in modern times, modern times, if Michelangelo would have said, I don't do Sistine Chapel. You see, all of these things have stress built into them whenever we serve God. The stress is not obeying God. The stress is getting the old stuff out of you that keeps you from obeying God. Right. Trusting God is the most critical thing that we face at any time in any way. So we've got all of these. How about Jeremiah? They actually put Jeremiah in a well because he told the truth. He's going, hey! You know, the city's going to be sacked unless you turn to God fully and completely. Put him in a well. And actually, one guy went and actually compassionately raised him up out of there and took him to his own house. So, I mean, you know, being down in the bottom of a cistern was not a pleasant place to be. You could ask Joseph about that someday. How about Jesus? There he is. He's coming to proclaim God's <coughs> truth. He is the Messiah, the so chosen Son of God. Fully God, fully man, and he's there, and they're going like, well, why don't you tell us who you are? You know, he says, I am, and they all go, whoa, you can't say that. That means that you're saying that you're God. Well, he is God. Yes. How about the empty tomb? How about for the disciples, like Mary Magdalene? She goes down there with a, another hundred pounds of spices, and, and the tomb's empty, and there's a bunch of guys in white sitting there. How stressful is that? Where is my Lord? Where have they taken him? It's incredible. There's stress. But yet there's also hope mixed in with that. How about the disciples and us? Where does Peter wind up after his first big preaching engagement? He winds up on trial. Why? Because in the power of the name of Jesus, he said, silver and gold have I none. Get up and walk. And the lame guy that they all knew gets up and walks. And so then the temple authorities go, wow, how'd you do that? You've been faking it for 40 years? <laughs> stress, stress, stress. God's word has some good things for us to say. So as we go through and look at God's word, let me give you some of the good things God's word had to say. First Peter 5. Here's the Peter that was arrested and thrown into jail. By the way, another great passage, and one that meant a lot to me personally, was Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. You can write it down, and you can read it. Stress is also defined as worry. I'm, I'm concerned, we say, concerned. In other words, we're sweating, fretting, and pumping hormones because we don't know what's happening tomorrow. We'll deal with that in a minute. See, whenever I was going through a big change in my life, this was the scripture that God used to reassure me that he was going to take care of me when we had no money and two kids and house payments and no job. 
I would go for a job and they would say, well, we don't think you're really qualified. Or the other one that was a kicker was, we don't think you'd be happy here. I'm going like, no! I don't, I, happiness has nothing to do with it. I want a job! <laughs> so 1 Peter says, so Matthew chapter 6, and Jesus tells us not to worry six times six times in that particular passage. Don't worry. Be anxious for nothing, he says. Don't get stressed out over any of this stuff. He says, God will care for you better than he cared for Solomon. Look at the lilies of the field. Look at everything else. The birds never go hungry. So look at what God can do. Okay, so Peter says, give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. Easy for you to say, Peter. How about this one that Paul says? Don't worry about anything. Yeah, Paul, easy for you to say. You're already writing Bible books. We're just here trying to get by in this world. So what are some simple lessons that we can learn? One of the things that's very interesting is uh, whenever we talk about simple lessons, one of the things that's happening now in uh, daily life is, or actually in, in culture, is that there are a number of books coming out about, about uh, how to have a full life and live with peace in your life. And one of the best ones that's come about is by an admiral by the name of William McRaven. And, <clears throat> and he was formerly in charge of all the Navy SEALs. And if you have not read this little book, you need to get it and read it. It will encourage you. And it's called Make Your Bed. Little Things Can Change Your Life. And you can also see his commencement speech to the University of Texas, and you can see it on YouTube. William McRaven. Look at these things. He says, start your day with a task completed. In other words, make your bed. Then you'll have something done. And he goes on down through it. If you look at these, a lot of these are biblical principles that he is using, except making your bed. Uh, you can't go at it alone. Look at that. Life's not fair. Drive on. My kids always used to come and say, Dad, it's not fair. I'd say, do you want fairness or do you want justice? And they'd go, fairness. Because somebody's going to suffer. Okay? You must dare greatly. That's what, that's what God tells us. That's what Jesus did. That's what Moses did. That's what Abraham did. Um, you got to dare greatly, and you never, ever quit. Over there at the Bud School in Coronado, I built some buildings over around there, and they have a big bell in the middle of a courtyard. And so if you can't do it, and you've got to finally quit, you run up and ring the bell, and then you're out. And so all of the suffering quits, but then you've got to live with that for the rest of your life. You have to live with that for the rest of your life. One of the other things that I like is you've got to give people hope. And so whenever you give people hope, you're operating on a significant basis to be able to do what God has commanded you to do. Okay, so let's take a look at some practical steps. You can check that out. By the way, there's another author you need to check out, and his name is Jordan B. Peterson. And Jordan B. Peterson is a psychologist, a clinical psychologist, and he's also a professor at the University of Toronto. And this guy is out there speaking truth and connecting it to biblical principles in a way I have never seen it happen in modern culture. And he is talking to people from the standpoint of you need to understand how important you are in today's culture and you need to fill the emptiness not only with purpose, but you need to do a host of other things. And in an interview with uh, John Anderson from Australia, he even uses this word. He says, the biggest thing that we miss in this life, in the culture today, is we miss the opportunity for metanoia. Metanoia is a Greek word for repentance. He says, people don't have the opportunity to repent. So here is this guy talking in an hour and a half interview, and he's using words like, we just need to model ourselves after Christ. He is the archetypical human being. We need to understand that whenever God said it was created and it was good, you need to check out Jordan B. Peterson 
talking with John Anderson. It's long and it'll stretch your mind, but you need to you need to watch it because he goes back to all of the biblical principles. And so he's uh, also written a book that's a million seller and it's called 12 Rules for Living a Life Without Chaos. And so the book is kind of intense. I'm into it now. But uh, uh, watch the YouTube videos. He has them on the death and resurrection of Christ. He's got everything. So let's look at some practical steps. So we got two people in culture that are saying that the missing thing today is the connection with a sense of, with a sense of purpose and a sense of being with the Almighty. He says, I'm not talking theologically, I'm talking about the way that you were wired. And so that's an incredible thing for him to say. And his truths are unimpeachable. So here we go, practical steps. If you're stressed out, you need to quit. Okay, that's pretty easy, huh, for me to say. Okay, the best thing is you need to get a good night's sleep. That's what they usually tell people who begin to enter into a therapeutic relationship with a psychologist or a psychotherapist. You need to get a good night's sleep. I mean, you really do. If you can't sleep all night long because of your sleep pattern, get a nap in the afternoon. Even 30 minutes will do you good. 60 minutes is okay. 90 minutes is optimal. Okay, so my body clock is, I don't shut down until one in the morning, I get up at nine, and then I take a nap in the afternoon if I can. So that's the only way that I can stay sharp. And so you need to find what your rhythm is, and uh, you need to do that. It was really a challenge when I was in the military. I was in the Navy on submarines. But um, uh, there, you know, we would have your circadian rhythms would be all upset because you would be on watch for six hours, you'd be off for 12, and then you're back on watch again. So you're functioning on a 16, on a on an 18 hour day and so it's really weird and so your body gets used to that kind of stuff uh, sometimes people would be on another one they would be on one with four hours on eight hours off and then back on again and so because you're young you could handle it but as you get older you can't and so I think I'm paying the price now for those kind of actions even when I was young so you need to understand that God has a pattern for you your sleep pattern is not my pattern. My pattern is not your sleep pattern. All I'm saying is you get a good night's sleep. Now, whenever you lay down at night, it's okay to read a book, but do not look at your iPad. Okay? That's what oftentimes keeps me awake as I'm reading my iPad. The reason is, is because the amount of light coming into your eyeballs is keeping you awake, is activating your brain into other things. Oftentimes, too, you will lay down and all these thoughts start going through your mind. Anybody ever have that one? Okay, so what do you do? Well, what you do is you, get, you keep a pencil and a piece of paper by your bedside, and whenever you start having all of these thoughts, bam, you just write them down. Okay, and then your mind knows that you've recorded it and acknowledged it, and so then you can go to sleep after that. The other thing is, is if you like to drink alcohol, don't do it within six hours of going to bed. Alcohol will actually keep you awake. The amount of sugar that's in alcohol, that's what it is. The amount of sugar that's in alcohol will, will go ahead and keep your system going far beyond what your system should. And so, you know, if you're taking a little toddy for the body, then do it in the afternoon. Uh, don't do it at work. Don't drive, but uh, do that. Uh, also, a lot of pharmaceuticals, you'll have to figure out when to do it, but my point is that you have to get a good night's sleep. It does not have to be eight hours. It does not have to be get into REM sleep. It does not have to do any of that. Don't worry about that. Just ask God to give you a good night's sleep. One of the other things that you can do oftentimes is whenever you do lay down is to be able to take and just flip open to the Psalms, and you can read the Psalms. And so then your eyes tracking back and forth across the page and reading God's truth will, will enable you to get the rest that's desired. Now a lot of times the enemy comes and he wants you to stay awake. And so we can help you with that. We, have, uh, we can pray for you and we can find deliverance for you from the enemy's bonds. 
And so, and then you can maintain yourself after that and resisting the enemy. Like if he says, uh, if the enemy comes to you and says, you haven't, you haven't written Aunt Martha in a month, okay, get out your paper and your pencil and go, write Aunt Martha. Okay, that one's gone. You really blew it today. Get away from me, Satan. I did what I knew I could do. And God's going to take care of me. And so you just have to take and do mental battle from there. Okay, so what's the next thing that you have to do? You've got to eat breakfast. Okay, this sounds like a strange thing. I know you're so important that you got up late because you didn't eat right. And now you got to run out of the house so you're not going to eat breakfast. Big mistake. Your body is running on hormones rather than, rather than on nutrients. So you need to get up and you need to get a good breakfast. Now, it may be oatmeal, it may be eggs, and it may be bacon. I love eggs and bacon. I love eggs and sausage. It may be any of those, but you have to get a combination of protein and carbs. You can't have just protein and you can't have just carbs and keep you going. Check it out. Your mother was right. You need to eat your breakfast. Okay. So I'm not your mama, but I'm just helping you out. You need to get some exercise. One of my biggest failings in life was I did sedentary jobs and then I realized a few years ago that here I was humongously overweight. I couldn't hardly get up off the floor. I called a friend of ours and I said, what gym was it that you were talking about? And I started going. So since June of 2016, I have lost 54 pounds. I, hey, that's not the big one. That's not the big one. I now have balance, I have stamina, I have the ability, I can, I can do things that I couldn't do previously, all because I go to the gym three days a week. That's my schedule. And so I do that so that I can be healthy enough because I'm middle-aged. Yeah. Some of you are laughing. I'm 74. It's the new math, common core. But anyway, so you need to be able to function in the areas that God has called you to. And we didn't always used to be a sedentary society. So you need to get out and be doing stuff, especially with other people. Uh, you can run. Pastor Allen runs. I saw him running down the highway the other day. And I thought, gosh, I wonder if he needs a ride. No, he was running. running down. And uh, he was going on the opposite side, so I couldn't run him over. But uh, anyway, because he's, he he's trying to make me feel guilty. But uh, anyway, so you need to be active. Even if it's just walking around your yard, your yard, walk briskly for 20 minutes. Get your heart rate up. If you do your heart rate check for a minute and you're running about 50 to 60, then you need to get up to 80 to 90 as you walk around. It's not the distance that you walk. It's the energy that you walk with. So you're going to have to get some exercise. Doing this does not count. Okay. Going once every three months and pumping iron does not count. You're going to have to do something that gets your cardio going. Okay. Now, the other thing that you have to do is you're going to have to be others mindful. Others mindful. And see, this is where we get into biblical territory. Because Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. Matthew 22 it's the great commandments that we need to do. If we are going to fulfill the great commission, we need to be all about the great commandments as the energizing source. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Those are the two key things that we need to be doing. First is we need to love God, know God, and then that will lead us to loving our neighbors. Who's your neighbor? Anybody that God puts you in contact with. We all have divine appointments that we can recount. And sometimes they happen in spectacular ways, and sometimes they just happen in what we would consider normal ways. I was talking with David, who owns a taxi cab company, and so he's saying the people that I mostly pick up are people that need assistance. And I said, perfect, because there's David, a born-again child of the Most High God. He's picking up people that need to have the contact of somebody that in some way is going to love them. Does he have to hug them? No. 
Does that mean he lets them ride for free? No. What it does is it means that he is a ready listener as they go ahead and tell their things that are going on in their lives. And David is doing that. It's a ministry. And so if we are involved in somewhere else, in the workplace or in school or wherever it is, that's what we have to do is look for God's divine appointments and then we have to love them. I also tell people that it doesn't matter where you are on the organizational chart at your work. The hierarchy doesn't matter because you are God's ambassador to that particular place and therefore you have influence. If you want to read more about spheres of influence, one of the old philosophers, Abraham Kuyper, used to talk about our spheres of influence and how we need to be, bring the rulership of Jesus Christ to every one of those. Work, school, home. We need to bring in Jesus Christ to every one of them. That doesn't mean that you wear a two-ton cross. It doesn't mean that you got Jesus saves on your nightlight. What it means is, is it means that you have to be looking for those divine appointments and trusting the Holy Spirit to give you the words to say. Okay, so you need to think about others' needs, especially when you go to bed at night. Pray for somebody else. Pray for somebody else. And not just that they'll quit making noise in the other room. Pray for somebody else. It's very important. We need to be others-oriented rather than self-oriented. One of the biggest problems that was foisted upon our culture was the whole self-esteem movement. Anybody remember that one? We're still suffering. Participation trophies? Come on, give me a break. How are these kids ever going to know about losing? How are they ever going to learn about that? Right now they can't. They can't learn about that, and so we have what's called helicopter parents. And so I've been talking with some of the people at the university, and they experience helicopter parents. And one of the person, people was telling me in the administration that some kid had missed the opportunity to sign up for a class, to register for a class, and the deadline was gone, but he needed that class. And so he's in there haranguing on the registrar while his mom is on the phone from somewhere back east haranguing on the registrar about the fact that he didn't sign up for the class. I've even heard about helicopter resumes. Yeah. It's where somebody puts in a resume and then the mom or dad comes down and badgers the interviewer on behalf of their child. Yeah. Is there something wrong with this? Yeah. Yes. Yes. It happens right here in Cedar City. Mm -hmm. You have to take responsibility for yourself. That's one of the things that Jordan Peterson and Jesus Christ always say. Okay. So you're going to have to do these things. You've got to get connected socially. This is the best safe place to do it. Once a week for an hour and a half, you can connect socially and you can be have your stress relief. We will pray for you. We will hug you. That's why we do meet and greet is so that you can get connected socially. You don't have to form a clique. You don't have to be part of a country club. You're part of the kingdom of God, which is the best thing going. Okay, so you're going to have to have laughter and levity. If it's just somebody telling you about what you're always doing wrong, that is not healthy. You probably already know what you're doing wrong. Why do you need somebody to remind it? One of the great things about my wife is that she does not remind me about all of the things that I have not done. Mm -hmm. oh real jewel. So you have to have laughter and levity. You're going to have to be able to laugh. If you can't get up and you can't laugh, just ask yourself, God's looking down from heaven, and how does he view me? I guarantee there's a lot of laughter and levity in heaven. Because laughter is something that comes from a full heart that's full of the joy of the Lord and spills over out into our everyday existence. And it happens to affect others around us as well. You have to have laughter and levity. You really do. Uh, Lisa Wright went over to work at the infusion clinic, and they used to have an answering message on the answering machine. And it would say, whenever you called into the infusion clinic, it said, if you are schizophrenic, punch four, five, and seven. 
If you are paranoid, we know where you are and we're coming to get you. If you have multiple personalities, dial four, five, and eight. You know, and all of these funny things, you know, and it was just like, okay, we're here in this serious business where people are uh, facing end of life issues and there's some levity going on. And it's not at the expense of somebody else. It's always deprecating. It always has to come from yourself. You can always tell enough jokes about yourself and the silly things that you've done in life to be able to make somebody else laugh. Amen? Amen. Okay. All right. You also have to have music. The reason that we sing is because God had put, God put that ability within us. It's not just about worshiping the Most High God. It's about music. Music. And so we need to understand that music comes from God. And so whatever form of music it is, if it's got God words to it, it's fantastic. I am being stretched in this day and time because of the new music that's coming out. We talked on Wednesday night about some of the music that we played at Easter, and some people didn't recognize any of the songs, and so they didn't sing. My thought is, if you don't recognize the song, give it a try. And so just use your voice. You know, the best place to practice, practice is not in your shower. It's in your car. You know, get, go for a drive by yourself, put the tape in, the CD, or whatever it is, and sing. Try it. And it works. I mean, it just lightens the mood. A lot of times whenever I'm doing stuff and trying to study, I'm reading God's Word, and I have music on. I have classical music on because I don't have to listen to the words and interact with the words. Uh, so I put on Bach, I put on Beethoven, I put on Mozart, I put on some of those, and then I just let them play. And it just refreshes me, it just refreshes me and organizes my mind. There was a study done, and they did it with prenatal uh, infants, and what they did was they had the mothers of a, of a group, they had them uh, do nothing but listen to classical music in some of the later stages of pregnancy. And so then whenever the child was born, uh, they tested them in the control group that had not had classical music played, and they trust, just, uh, tested them on their mathematical ability. And those that had listened to Baroque music, Bach, Beethoven, that stuff, had a much higher capacity for mathematics. Interesting. If you look at Bach's compositions, then they are all mathematically precise. And so it's an incredible thing to realize the genius that was there. Uh, they always used to call Johann Sebastian Bach, they would actually call him the fifth evangelist. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were the other four. Mm -hmm. But because he wrote the things that so affected the world and still do, mm -hmm. that he was called the fifth evangelist. Okay, now... Practical steps, immediate analysis. Okay, how do I put us all into framework? How do I change and how do I do this? So any issue that comes your way, whether it's spiritually oriented or whether it's practical, I'm putting this into my own words. Okay? First question you got to ask, do I trust God to care for me? Peter said he would, but Peter ain't here no more. Peter doesn't know the problems I'm having with my computer. But God does, because he gave, created the technology. So that's the first question that you have to get nailed down. Because if you don't trust God to care for you, none of the rest of what I'm going to say is going to make any sense, because you're going to have to solve the problem. And you're going to have to deal with the stress with your own understanding. And that's not biblical. Okay? So the next thing is is whenever you have something come your way. Pastor, we need to do something about the parking lot. Yes, I know. Is this my responsibility? Probably. Okay? It's also going to be your responsibility when you find out the cost to get it paid. Um, and, so, and so I'm going to share the responsibility. So say, you have, uh, say your car is making a funny noise. And so you have to ask, is this my responsibility? Yes, if it's your daily transportation. If it's the neighbor's car that's making noise, probably not. If you know how to fix it, if you know how to fix it, then offer to help. 
But if you don't, if it's coming to you first, say your kid calls you, or one of your children, I'm sorry, one of your children who are, who are all above average are calling you and, and, uh, and they're saying to you, Dad, I just don't know what to do with life. I've got so many things going on. The first thing you need to do is ask, and they're in their 50s. Then you need to ask, is this really my responsibility? I will listen to you, but I can't fix you. Okay, so you need to ask, is it my responsibility to undertake this task? Oftentimes, we want to help everybody, or we see ourselves as having the ability to do everything, and so we need to, we need to apportion it out. We need to understand that we have areas of responsibility, and oftentimes the compassion will overlap, but the actual doing the thing will not. Okay, we always need to be compassionate, and not just tell whoever's coming to you, suck it up, Leroy, it's all yours. Don't do this. Okay? The next thing, that if we determine that it may be my responsibility, the next thing that we ask is, when does this task need to be handled? Okay? If you come to me this week and say, Pastor, I need help putting my 1040 together. I first have to ask, is this my responsibility? No. But I can tell you what to do. File for an extension. Pay what you owe, file for an extension. And then get it done. Next year, get it done early. Okay? So there are different ways that we do that. Is, do I possess, do I possess the resources to do the job? See, oftentimes out of compassion, we attempt to do things, and we make a mess out of it. And the reason is because we don't have the resources to do it. If somebody wants to get off drugs and we say, okay, I'll pray for you, we need to understand that there is a component for them too. And so that's just an example. If somebody needs to get out of debt, well, then we can help them. But there is a component in which prayer takes a large part because things are spiritual in origin. But we also need to remember that there are actions that they need to take. You see, and so we can give them the insights and help them to discover the actions that they need to take. So whenever I have these thoughts come my way, the first thing I ask is, do I really trust God to care for me? That's probably the biggest one. Pastor, I'm thinking about changing jobs. This workplace is horrible. So as a pastor, my question is, tell me about what's going on, and then I listen to the Holy Spirit, and then I say, maybe you could try this, especially with the one that's really harassing you. Maybe you could try this. First of all, pray for them. Okay, second, be able to share a word to them that will encourage them in what they're on. Don't try and, don't try and change them totally and completely at first. God will do that. See, we're responsible for sharing the good news. God's responsible by the Holy Spirit for changing people. And he will. And then once he does, and they go along with it, then we're responsible for encouraging them. So whenever I look at the scriptures, I see a couple here. They're out of Proverbs, both of them. Proverbs 22, verse 3. A prudent person, a prudent person, foresees danger and takes precautions. The simpleton goes blindly on and suffers the consequences. You know, the Bible talks a lot about the fool and the wise man. Mm -hmm. Did you know that being a fool is not an intellectual uh, element? It's a moral element. In other words, somebody has chosen to be stupid. And so you can see it all the time, people making those kind of choices. Either they take on things that they weren't equipped for, things that they don't need, or things that are thrust upon them and they haven't called out for help. And so you see, it's a moral issue. See, as those that know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we are called to be ambassadors to a culture, which means that we need an intelligence and ability far above and beyond what we came into this world with humanly. We need the Holy Spirit at every way, place, and time. Not just so that you can go around talking in tongues or healing people, biggest one is that you need to be able to share the words of life. In this culture, one of the key things that we say is Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. 
and no one comes to the Father but through him. They agree with the first part. The tougher one is the, is the next one. Proverbs 1 opens with this one. Fear of the Lord. And we're all going like, man, I don't want to fear God. That's not what it's talking about. It's not talking about a dread of your sovereign Lord. It is a reverence for. The word fear has always been translated and we mistake it now. And we know that it does not mean His wrath because we have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and we have been therefore saved by the blood of Jesus Christ and the victorious resurrection from the wrath of God for being evil. Amen. Another thing that you need to understand is that you have a capacity for evil. You do. Where did the guards at Auschwitz come from? Normal German families, many of them church goers. But there was an evil within that was not recognized. And so therefore it was allowed to proliferate. You need to understand that. Okay, so what passage could I key on to be able to get my bearings at any day, way, shape, or fine time? How about this one, Psalm 23? The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. Not all that I want. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength, guides me along right paths, all of it to bring honor to his name, not necessarily yours. Remember, he's using you, he's using you in the form of sheep as a metaphor for something that is perfectly incapable of taking care of themselves. Okay, vulnerable, he's using sheep. He's using the shepherd as a way of guiding you. So whenever we understand that our stress that we incorporate into our lives is destructive, but that we can surmount all of that, he says, you are now overcomers in Christ. That's Amen. Romans chapter 8. Amen. We are not under the circumstances. We are overcomers in Christ. That means that we're going to go through stuff. Jesus suffered and died. All of the apostles have, uh, suffered and died. John, the writer of Revelation, probably according to legend, suffered the greatest amount of suffering, and that's why he was on Patmos, is because they poured hot oil down his throat, and then they exiled him to Patmos, and he wrote that when he was in his 90s. He was still following God. Some of the others, like Thomas, he was dismembered in Goa, which is in, Italy, which is in India. There are many others who suffered horrific fates. Like Peter, Peter couldn't have his uh, head chopped off in Rome because he wasn't a Roman citizen. So he asked, according to legend, to be hung upside down on a cross because he wasn't worthy to die in the same way as his Savior. Paul had his head chopped off, one of the benefits of being a Roman citizen. Did those, those guys know stress? Yes. Did those guys know God? Yes. <coughs> we have to put our trust in Him. The only way that we can get through a stressful life like we're going through is to be able to trust God, first of all, to take care of us, then ask, is this my responsibility? Then we need to ask, how, when does this have to be done? And then that'll put things in the proper perspective and order, and then sometimes things have a way of taking care of themselves. And so then we also need to ask, do I have the resources to be able to do this? See, Pastor Allen's getting ready to build a house. He's got the property, and he's getting ready to build a house. And so he is now going through the time of getting the loan approved and everything else. Does Pastor Allen have the resources? Yeah, he does. He knows how to build. He's worked as a carpenter for a long time. Uh, is he going to do it alone? No. We're going to help him. And so we're going to experience the joy of fellowship while we do it because we're going to be others oriented and we're going to help Pastor Allen. It'll be a great time. So you see, Pastor Allen is reducing the stress of getting the house built by knowing us in a social setting. And then we are also in the kingdom of God, part of the church of Christ. So we're going to go do it along with him. We're not going to do the nasty stuff like sheetrock. He can do that himself. You can all bring that. <laughs> no, no, that's not that's not my area of responsibility. But you see what I'm saying is instead of taking on all this stuff as stress, 
sometimes I encourage people, write it down. Write down what you're thinking you have to do, and then put those three tests to it. <coughs> Is it mine to do? Does it have to be done right now? Emma sometimes says, take the trash out, would you? And I will say, does it have to go out right now? Yeah. Sometimes she will say yes, because it's got stinky stuff in it. Or no, it can go a little bit later. OK. And then get it done. I hope that helps avoid stress. Nikki, was that beneficial in some way, shape, or form, or are you just being nice? No, it was helpful. OK. <laughs> hey, why don't you stand with me, and we'll close in prayer.